It is appropriate to call the now the present, for the present is a gift, a gift of life. And for that, every waking moment should be a moment of gratitude and appreciation. So here we are in Kotakinabalu, the fascinating city in the tropical islands of Borneo. It's a modern capital city with 30 ethnic groups living in its land. While just around the corner, you'll get lush rainforests and astounding beaches. With so much to see and not knowing where to start, we contacted the Beach Bums Borneo, who helped us organize a tour around some of the islands. Right now, we're in Tunku Abdul Rahman Marine Park. Now, it was named after our first prime minister. There are five islands, which I'm going to be hopefully visiting all of them. Uh, over there, we've got Gaia. We're heading over to Manukan, but uh, they are beautiful. They're very different, so I can't wait to see how different each little island is. This boomerang-shaped island was an old stone quarry before World War II, hence some of the old graves can still be seen. Not only is it the site of TAR Park's headquarters, I heard that they have the Marine Exhibition Center as well, which was the first meeting point for Erwan and myself as we met up to discuss the restoration of coral reefs that were wrecked by the Greg Storm about eight years ago. How long have you been doing the... Uh, the the reef rebuild. For the artificial reef, we started in 2005 basically, so it's almost five, seven years. For, for the things that we use in our reef, yeah. uh, we use the ultra ball, it's about two ton in weight. Two tons? And uh, the height is about 1.3 meters. Wow, so that's... It's amazing. quite huge, it's quite huge. According to the manufacturer actually, the yeah. the, the pH for the reef ball is yeah. natural pH. So it's like a so neutral... So it's natural for the reef. So that's why it attracts the fish, attracts the coral as well. So there's no toxins, there's no, no toxins for of, There's no drawback of putting these in the exactly, water. Exactly, yes. That's great. That's absolutely amazing. Now how long does it take? You, you were saying you planted these in 2005. Yes, November 2005. But how long does it actually take until you sort of notice that there's it's life? It's more than one, one year actually. After six months we do some monitoring for this yeah. and we can see a very tiny, small uh, New recruitment of coral, uh, especially the acropora and fossilifora. Yeah. So it starts to grow, and after almost six years, it's become almost a meter. Whoa! So you're, you're going to be showing me a little bit later. Sure, no problem. Yeah. Excellent. Looking forward to that. Now here's a little travel tip for you guys. If you do decide to be little bugs, which you shouldn't be, um, this is exactly how long it takes to break down in the oceans. Now. Organic stuff, I always think that organic stuff, yeah, fine, it decomposes, but actually banana skin takes two years. We've got tin cans over here, that takes 50 years. Um, little plastic bags, 20 years. Glass, now glass takes a very long time indeed. It's actually made of sand, so you think it's kind of like one big cycle, but it's not because it takes one million years to decompose. Uh, plastic bottles, that takes, I mean, there is no time for that because it's indefinite. They, it, it just doesn't decompose. These things are really bad plastics. Um, and aluminium cans, 100 years. So be responsible, either recycle or just don't throw your, your rubbish in the oceans. Be responsible, guys. Since it's never enough to just look around and talk about it, well, it's time to get hands on with the subjects. And check this out, yo. I learned a new gearing up trick. Oh, yeah. Yo, it's courtesy of my cameraman, Jeff, the man. <laughs> Around 200 reef balls that weigh a total of 540 tons have been planted at the mid-reef area off Manukan Island. Alrighty, artificial reefs, here we come. These were the first used by the Sarawak government at Pulau Talang Talang in 1998. And about half a million of these reef balls have been deployed in 43 countries around the world. 
All the Reef Ball Foundation projects require monitoring and the most include scientific investigation. On the overall, evidence has shown that reef balls can easily reach 80% of the natural species diversity and population of nearby natural reef systems within just a few years. I gotta tell you guys, that is, uh, that is some work they've been doing down there because it's so beautiful to see, I mean, not so beautiful to see all the dead coal around it, but everything that's flourishing, like that's new, is because of those reef balls. Now, there is just an awesome amount of new sort of uh, animals and new coral that's been growing on these things. And there's just this brand new ecosystem that everything's sort of just coming back to normal. So hopefully in a few years time, uh, it'll have all have grown and it'll be a beautiful dive spot. The more we foster our marine life, the more eco-friendly underwater activities can be made available for our entertainment. Now I've done snorkeling, I've done scuba diving, and here on Manukan Island there's a very special way of getting around on the waters. It's the scuba doos. Designed for an easy operation, the scuba doo has no requirements. If you can't swim, not a problem. No swimwear? Who cares? You can even wear your spectacles in your scuba doo. Greetings, creatures of the underworld. The council has bestowed upon me the role of being your master. I have summoned you here to declare that it's your mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilization, to boldly go where no fish has gone before. The answer is out there, Nemo, and it's looking for you, and it will find you if you want it to. That's a completely strange experience. It's like being on the other side of a fishbowl. You're the actual fish and bam, that's fun. Some sort of giants coming up next on Without Boundaries. The very next day, we made our way to Jesselton Point, waterfront jetty at the north of downtown KK. We met with Alvin Wong, the project director of Merck. We took a 15 minute boat ride to Gaia, the biggest of the TAR Park Islands, and right in the center of its massive bay was Guyana Eco Resort. I'm here on Tulok Malaham, and that's a special part of Pulau Gaia. And over here, there is a great little place called the Marine Ecology Research Center, or Merck for short. Now, due to human error, it costs the ocean. So over here, they try to teach people uh, what not to do and what to do. And a couple of things that they actually do is replanting coral fragments. And there is a rehabilitation center for giant clams. So that's exactly what I'm here for. And hopefully, I'm going to get stuck into it. Two years ago, they began a journey to return to the environment what humans have exploited in the past. And last year, they were honored the most innovative tourist award by Tourism Malaysia. Now to date, Merck has successfully produced all the seven species of giant clams found in Malaysia. After an introductory video screening, I was introduced to Kirsten, who will kickstart my undertakings of being a marine biologist for a day. Um, our main projects here are propagating of all the seven species of giant clams. Okay. So there are eight species in the world, and seven of these can be found in the Malaysian waters. Seven? All seven? Yep. Wow. All seven. And where's the eight hole? Fiji. Fiji. Yeah. These are all the seven that yes, you have uh, grown. Wow. Now, what's the process? I mean, I would, I would sort of think that, you know, you, you grab a clam, you put it in the water and it's fine, but there's, there's quite a lengthy process to it. What, what is it? Um, so, after the spawning process, we have to um, settle them. Yeah. So, it'll take a while for them to settle. And how long, how long does that take? Um, normally, it'll take three years. Three, three years? Three years before we put them back into the sea. Wow, that's good. Now, you've also, I mean, we're going to be doing a lot later on, but uh, one of the other things that you also do is uh, replanting sort of coral fragments. Now, how important is that? Right now, the corals are very, uh, they are an important ecosystem to the ocean. Wow. So it's because, one of the main problems is because of like divers and snorkelers. Yeah. They are not um, 
they, 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 they seem to just be yes. touching and touching. bringing yeah. stuff around. Their fins? Uh, ah, yeah. lazy divers, the ones you can't sort of, you know, stay. Or they stand foot. on the corals. Terrible. Nah, there's also, I mean, the, there's problems with sort of the locals, like the fishermen and the things. Well, what kind of stuff do they do that affects? Um, like there are some fishermen around here, they still do fish bombing. Fish bombing? Yes. And that's and when that... they actually literally put explosive in the water. And that's why I think there's a lot of effort going into sort of saving these guys and regrowing and that's pretty amazing. This is what Kirsten calls the white room, and I call it the baby food factory. Two types of planktons are kept and cultured and bred for the feeding of baby clams. Now the different shades of brown in these bottles notify how far along the planktons are. Now since one batch was ready, Kirsten entrusted that bottle into my hands. And no, I did not spill anything, and then Cheryl took over. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm I brought you? I brought some baby food. <laughs> the plankton. Plankton, yes. yes. So what are these? Different. These look small. Yeah, this is the baby clam. This is Maximus. Oh, species. wow, they are really, really small, huh? Yeah. So what, what do we do now? Do okay, we, we just pour it? Just pour it in. You're going to trust me to pour this in, huh? Ready? Yes, yeah. yeah. go ahead. Here, yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> You're natural. You're I know, natural. I know look at this. Do. I'm a loving parent. Already. <laughs> These clams need major taking care of. These waters are changed every day and they need to be fed every alternate day. But these guys seem to be doing a flawless job in nurturing and while guaranteeing their growth. This one, should I grab it? Yeah, I can wow. look at it. Thank you so much. All right, wow, so how many you got on here? This one is around uh, 60 to 70 clams inside. 60 to 70? Yeah. Really? Yeah, you can come it. <laughs> I, I believe you, I believe you. So, uh, this is my catch and release, I guess. This yep. is this is the big moment. Yep, you go now. All right, All right let's, let's go. go. But before diving, I got sidetracked into participating in the Adopt a Coral program. And this time, another pretty little lady named Vanessa was in charge of this section. Looks like these biology lessons are windows to good chemistry, huh? Mm hmm. So these are the corals that you found out out in the uh, on the floor bed, which have been damaged. Yeah. Okay. And then so once it comes, once you run it in cement, you put it in the rehabilitation uh, tank uh, for two weeks. Then we go the diving. Wild, like that. Uh, yeah, this one is adopted, but yeah, we go diving. Okay. And go diving, we put it down on the tables. Uh huh. Yeah, and they stay there, and we keep taking care of them until they're big enough to go into the reef. Wow, great. So now we can do the planting. Yeah, let's do it. Now you can choose your coral. Okay, I'm going to yeah. go for this guy over here. He looks yeah, like he needs a good home. And this will be your tag number. So oh, that's my tag number? Yeah, so we can... His name is P55. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> is that right? So you're actually the 1,550th person to find a coral here. Wow, that's a, that's a lot of people. So this is, this is my... Uh, your this is your cement base. This is my cement base. Visitors can choose to adopt the coral fragments they planted, and Merck will periodically update them on the progress of that fragment with photos and growth measurements. I think it's cool how they make it possible for absolutely anyone and everyone to make an important and interactive contribution to our underwater habitat. Ready. Okay, so you planted a coral here. Yeah, good. Oh my gosh. You saved the environment. I, I'm saving the environment. I'm one step closer to, uh, yeah, being yeah, Captain okay. Planet. Right, now we're... Now the reefs were built around their center where the clams and corals are well sheltered. So right now we've jumped on the boat and uh, we've got on board baby clams and uh, fragments of coral that we're going to put down onto the shelves, which are sort of like the... Um, You'd say kind of like a nursery until they've actually gotten used to the water and they've grown a little while and then after that it takes a, a few years for them to get used to it and then they can start moving them around. Uh, but uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing how many they have down there and uh, playing my part in reintroducing some wildlife back into the ocean. We started off with checking up on the coral reefs first. All the adopted corals have been left to stabilize in the tanks. Once they're ready, they're brought out into the sea and affixed onto underwater structures such as rocks to promote growth and protect the corals. Then we moved on to, wait, let me get this right, Tridus nursquamosa, 
and the Hippopotamus. And uh, all right, never mind. I can't actually remember the rest. But clams filter the marine ecosystems to help maintain high water quality. Dear Merck, your noble and selfless works have tugged at my heart, and I am honored to be a part of it. In the marathon of redeeming life, you have taken the first step. Thank you for being the catalyst of change that we need to see in this world. A battle of the fittest, coming up next on Without Boundaries. Our next island on the list was Sapi. Now, Sapi Island is often regarded as one of the most beautiful beaches, yet not overcrowded. But I searched for odd activities to amuse myself with, and I found just the thing. Oh. Ready to go sea walking? Let's go. Let's go. So we followed the tour boat and it brought us to the floating station located between Manukan and Sapi. Now very different from scuba diving, sea walking actually uses some of these helmets. Check these out. Now these go over your top, resting your shoulders, and this is where you look out. And you don't need any sort of scuba equipment because it's all attached to the, uh, the main line. So they pump fresh air in uh, and you just enjoy the uh, you just enjoy the scenery really so all those non super divers out there this is the alternative shoes are provided and no weight belts were needed because the helmet alone weighs 35 kilograms Phew. but why do sea walking yo when you can do sea dancing Oh yeah, oh yeah, Scoop Steve turning into Disco Steve, oh yeah, mama. <laughs> but honestly, this thing feels really odd. It's so bizarre to be walking on the seabed when we're so used to just gliding around when we dive. The weirdest part was taking off my helmet and realizing my head was dry, what? That was just strangely trippy. Now, I pretty much stepped foot on all the islands in Tunku Abdel Rahman uh, Marine Park, but uh, I hear the best view is actually off this boat. Well, technically, not off this boat, but 100 meters up. So I heard that in other parts of the world, a parasailing landing is called a splashdown, where the parasailer unhooks himself from the parasail and lands into the sea. But I highly doubt that I'm going to be doing any of that. And since I've got no control over the parachute, well, I simply have to trust the boatman in keeping me out of the water. All righty, here we go. We're just about to head out on uh, my little parasailing trip. There's my little cameraman down there. Hello! <laughs> I'm getting pretty high! <laughs> oh god, we seem to be slowing down. And I'm sinking. We're getting very close. Seeing the world from a different angle sometimes can be the best, you know. Variety is the spice of life. Just yesterday we were here at the Beach Bums Borneo Jetty to go out on a tour. But this time we'll be sticking around and enjoying their water sports instead. Almost every water sport you can think of, they have the equipment. So it's gonna be a good time. So I find out that someone in my crew is an actual professional kayaker, and that's and that's this guy warming up behind me. So uh, so we've got we've got some money on the table, and uh, we're going to do a bit of a competition as to see who can be the fastest kayaker in Borneo. <laughs> Weighing in at 308 pounds, the man who can tackle a lion with his bare hands. It's Jeff, Howdy. the Iron Harms. And at 210 pounds, the jack of all trades, Henry the Speedy Man Golding. Gentlemen ready, let the fight begin. And they're off. Henry takes the lead, making a swift early sprint, providing a challenge to Jeff, who still seemed composed and unworried. And I see why. Jeff is very quickly overtaking Henry's kayak as the arms of steel are working their magic. 
Can Henry overtake Jeff once more? Well, he's catching up. He's getting closer. They're moving at the same speed. Wait a second. What a close fight this is. The suspense is thickening. And it's 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 Henry in the lead. No, no, no. Wait a second. Now it's Jeff. And look at that. We have ourselves a winner. <laughs> Looks like I, uh, I lost from uh, Muscles Man here, yeah, against Muscles Man, but my next activity should be a bit easier for myself because Mother Nature pretty much takes over from that. It's a bit of windsurfing. <laughs> He's never gonna let me live it down, I tell you. So sadly, Mother Nature got a little bit camera shy and decided to stop blowing her wind, so the windsurfing uh, went out the window, but luckily for my crew, we've decided to go on that little baby. Now this is the flying fish, one of those water sports that not only exactly challenging and doesn't require any skills, but it's pure fun. It's the first time that I got to enjoy an activity with my entire crew. Well, except Jeff, of course, because, well, he's got to film it. He thought we were acting like a bunch of monkeys anyway, which, of course, we were, without shame. And if this flying fish required skills, Amin wouldn't have made it because he was lying down throughout the entire ride. So we've, uh, we thought it was the end of the day, but uh, I think it's only just getting started. We've, we've noticed that these kids are playing some golf on the, uh, on the little sandbank over here. So I thought I might as well go over and uh, see if I can chip a couple of little birdies, you know? One to one no. yeah. This guy's so cute, man. Huh? Come this side. Come this side. Huh? River? The hole, huh? Okay. Good chat. Alright. Do my back stretches. Oh! Get in there, get in there. You need the you need the champion champion glasses. Ah. <laughs> I don't think the glasses work. <laughs> Jump! Just get the ball. <laughs> See, it's the little things in life, you know, just a dry bit of land, you know, some street kids couple of golf clubs and a few white balls, that's all you need. There are always two sides to a coin. It's up to you if you want to complain about the rose having thorns, or if you want to be grateful that the thorns have roses. Next week on Without Boundaries, I'll be in Sampono, which can only mean one thing. I'll be one step closer to Sibidan.